Okay, good evening. My clock is showing that it is seven o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started with tonight's Kansas 4-H Animal Science webinar series. Tonight, we are learning about managing heat stress in your 4-H livestock uh, with Dr. Chase Reed. So I'm going to let Dr. Reed introduce himself to you here in just a moment. Um, a few housekeeping things, just reminders. If you'll keep your microphones muted and your videos turned off during the presentation, that will help conserve the bandwidth. But if you you do have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. We'll address all of those at the end of tonight's presentation, um, and you can also ask questions at the end as well. So with that in mind, um, a reminder that we are recording tonight's session. We'll post that to the Animal Science Project page on the Kansas 4-H website, and we would also really appreciate it if you would complete the survey at the completion of tonight's program or sometime within the next few days. That just gives us an idea at Kansas 4-H how we can serve you better and um, will help us to know what other things that you want to learn about for your 4-H projects. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Reed and um, enjoy the show and make sure you ask lots of questions. Well, thanks, Kelsey. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so let's get this thing going here. So uh, I, I kind of, you know, this presentation is just, it's so, sort of geared towards, you know, not only 4-Hers, but 4-H parents too. Uh, my, my little girl there, her name is Violet. She's going to be three soon. Vi is not quite 4-H age yet, but she does, uh, you know, we, we have a small ranch and and try to raise a few club calves and she does have a love for the cattle. And so I've got that connection as well, aside from having participated myself. And so I tried to kind of make this appealing to both, to both parents and kids, uh, both. But uh, if you have a question, just please, please uh, let me know. I'm not, not a frequent Zoom presenter, but Kelsey can flag me down and let me know there's a question coming through or whatever the case is. I can kind of see here on my, on my, uh, just the, the PowerPoint display on my end. So Hope you guys are doing okay and surviving the heat. Uh, quick, quick note about who I am. That's that's me there at my first job up in Washington, Kansas, where I practiced for a year right after I graduated from vet school. Uh, I 4-H'd, you know, from the time I was seven all the way till I graduated from high school in 2007. Uh, my family has a small cow calf operation near Burden, Kansas. If you guys know where that is, we're probably 45 minutes southeast of Wichita. Uh, I participated on livestock and horse judging teams, for that matter. Uh, all the way through 4-H and then college uh, and uh, had, you know, uh, a chance to have great mentorship, you know, originally from, from Kelsey, my old 4-H uh, and, and ag agent, uh, all the way on through uh, uh, Butler and Oklahoma State. And then, and then I actually coached judging teams for a couple of years uh, there before I went back to vet school. So I've got a, you know, I'm, I'm not any kind of brain surgeon, but I've got a fairly well-rounded experience on all, you know, kind of aspects of, of the 4-H experience and, and uh, I'm happy to, to give back to the, to the program and contribute with a small presentation here. Uh, so I, I, uh, I made some notes here because you'd probably hear me um and ah the entire time. So I'm going to kind of read off my notes, uh, but basically uh, what the ultimate question we have to ask is why even bother with any of this? Uh, uh, this quote from Stephen Covey, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is a book that sits on my shelf that I actually haven't read, but it probably would be good to read it. Uh, but I, it was something I found from there on a quick survey was that stuck with me is that doing the right things for the right reason is the right way, in the right way is the key to quality of life. So that's a Covey quote there. Um, the right reason uh, basically is that animal well-being is just our ethical responsibility, which all of us being, you know, involved in animal projects and 4-H uh, understand that fundamental tenant. Uh, stewardship, uh, these projects are zoomed in views of the macro industry that feeds the world. Uh, if you like it or not, we're stewards and representatives in that endeavor to the people who walk past our stalls, whether it's the county fair, the state fair, the American Royal, wherever. Um, that might be the only contact with food systems that these people who walk past the stall may have. Uh, our stall, you know, do we want to look like a quagmire or do we want to be neat and tidy? Uh, do we want the animals, you know, looking uncomfortable, breathing heavily, or should they be resting comfortably in spite of how hot it is? Uh, we also participate in these projects beyond just enrichment. Uh, 
for our, for our own or beyond just stewardship for our own enrichment, uh, spending time with mom, dad, brother, sister, grandma, grandpa, whoever else helps you as a 4-H'er. Uh, my experience was non-traditional in that respect due to my family structure. Uh, people who mentored me are now some of my very best friends and uh, trusted advisors uh, now that I'm a parent too. In addition to family time, we celebrate many years of ag and ag exhibitions that came before us. Any 4-H'ers listening, I'd encourage you to ask your parents, grandparents about their experience with stock shows and consider that they went through the process as well and connected with their projects the same way you're probably connecting with yours uh, and have their own unique perspective about it. We learn to connect hard work to rewards. The rewards are not always victory in the ring or a specific payout at the premium sale. Those things are excellent, of course, uh, but sometimes the process in itself is rewarding. Uh, so many times in life, we have to go ahead and do something in order to figure out what works and what doesn't. The lesson itself is a reward. The county fair was one of my very favorite times of year. Uh, I loved it as a 4-H'er. Uh, I just encourage you to soak up every minute of that and just uh, try to enjoy yourself. So now that we have the right reason in mind, uh, we're going to consider what, what the right things. Uh, the, uh, we, we view animal well-being uh, through the lens of the five freedoms, kind of first described in the 60s, uh, commonly incorporated, understood as the humane way to interact with livestock. Those freedoms have evolved and expanded today to encompass provisions by which we ensure that the five freedoms are being met. Okay, uh, we understand now uh, that in our imperfect world, there will never quite be a utopia where no animal is ever thirsty. That's an unrealistic expectation, but uh, we do things in a, in a way to minimize distress to cattle, sheep, hogs, any of our livestock projects, uh, you know, so, so that we can provide for these five freedoms. So uh, we have the freedom from hunger and thirst, and we provide for that with ready access to fresh water and a diet to maintain health and vigor. Freedom of discomfort is uh, answered by providing an appropriate environment, including shelter and a comfortable resting area. Freedom from pain, injury, disease, uh, prevention of those things, or rapid diagnosis and early treatment. Uh, freedom to express normal behavior, sufficient space, proper facilities, company of the animal's own kind, uh, things like that. And then freedom from fear and distress or ensuring conditions uh, and treatment are designed to, to uh, avoid mental suffering in the animal. So we've kind of uh, used those uh, five freedoms to understand the five provisions and, and how we can accomplish all of these things. So we have the right reason, the right things, and now we'll kind of talk about the right way. And, and I want you to understand this is just my, my two cents. Uh, this is, you can go a long way and, and, uh, uh, listen to a lot of different presentations about this. This is just one dude's opinion on, on one way to get it done. There are certainly other ways to, you know, other methods of making omelets besides just my recipe, but um, the way to accomplish these things relating to our livestock projects. Um, I'm a cattle person, so I'll kind of center all these things around the beef project, but please understand all these techniques can be adapted, adapted to various species. We'll have some places to visit about crossover between species uh, as we go along. So a quick note about the physiology of heat stress. Um, these things are rough estimates, these uh, thermoneutral zone ranges here. You can see some species have narrower windows than others. The large animal species, with the exception of swine, you know, we're thinking are from 40 or 45-ish degrees to around 80. Obviously, the thermostat right now in Winfield America is hovering somewhere around 100-ish with a little, little higher on the heat index. So we're outside the thermoneutral zone, meaning our animals are expending energy to, to stay cool. Uh, there's a much narrower range of temperatures uh, in the smaller species. Uh, expending energy anywhere colder than 60-ish to try to keep warm and also higher than 70 or 75. So kind of kind of hard to remember what it was like back in the winter, you know, when you guys were probably putting out hay for your, for your pears back in February when it was snowing and blowing and cold. That's a whole other conversation. But on either end, outside of that thermoneutral zone, you know, the animals have to uh, have to expend some energy somehow to either stay warm or keep cool. So uh, this, we'll kind of talk about some more of the physiology of heat stress here. Um, how do animals dissipate heat? There's uh, sort of some info I found from the Noble Research Institute that talks about the different methods, uh, breathing, dissipating heat from body surfaces, and then the reduction of feed and forage intake are kind of the three primary ways. So breathing, 
Uh, respirations are a good uh, estimator in cattle of their current ability to mitigate heat stress. You know, it's a kind of a broad strokes barometer of how you can tell how your animals are doing. Uh, in the bovine, normal respirations should be from 10 to 30 a minute. So the way I measure that is I get my watch or a timer. I let about 15 seconds go by and count how many breaths they take in that 15 seconds, multiply it by four and boom, there you go. You've got an answer. Um, very heavy breathing. You can see some animals standing with their limbs kind of open so that they're trying to open in their chest, open mouth breathing, that sort of thing. Those are all indicators that we might be struggling with some heat a little bit. Um, you can judge the muscle effort it takes, the abdominal push that it might take with exhaling, all those things. Um, as they're trying to breathe off that warm air, um, you know, it, it contributes to the, to the metabolic energy that they're putting into to staying cool. Um, heat always flows down a concentration gradient, you know, meaning from a, a high concentration to a low concentration. So when it's really hot like this and everything's hot, there's nowhere for the heat to go and it's just going to absorb into your, your project. So um, we've got to try to somehow uh, dissipate heat from body services. Our next point in order to create that concentration gradient so that there's somewhere for heat to go. Um, we accomplish those kind of in four ways here. Um, convection, conduction, evaporation, and radiation. And we'll sort of uh, hit on these in more detail because these are kind of the keys to mitigating heat stress. Convection is air moving across the animal, breaking up that layer of air that's entrapped by the skin and hair. Um, you know, wind and fans, the breeze, uh, heat sitting on the surface of the skin has to go somewhere. So we, you know, it's, it's uh, second nature to us to just put a fan on something we want, but this is actually the mechanism by which we dissipate heat out uh, across the body surface that way. Uh, conduction, again, that's direct contact with a cool surface or substance. I think uh, probably everybody saw back in early June when they had those big feedlot die-offs of, of cattle uh, that happened. Everybody saw that making the rounds on social media. Basically, the cattle are hit, hit with late summer temperatures and early summer. The ground heats up. It's, it's warm at night. There's just no, no way to acclimatize those cattle to get them ready for that. And basically the, the ground ends up cooking them at night. They don't have that, they don't have that ability to reset their thermostat overnight because every single substance, the pins, the ground, everything is hot. So we can make some conductive effort to cool them off by having cool services and substances that the cattle can bed down on. Same way with sheep, hogs, goats, all that. Uh, evaporative cooling, uh, that's gonna be like your, your rinsing, uh, sweating moisture from the animal, um, as you dry your animal, you're blowing away the warm moisture, uh, literally providing evaporative cooling. Pigs are, are the poorest sweaters of any of our important species. If you uh, look at the actual mechanisms in a pig's skin on, on cross-section of microanatomy, you can see they have glands that are similar to the other species, but they just don't work very well. So it's sort of a misnomer that pigs don't sweat, but they kind of sweat very little because of the poor structure of those glands. Pigs rely on other methods of cooling to thrive. Uh, the wash rack is going to be extra important for your swine projects at the fair and in the days leading up to the fair. And then the last one for me that was, uh, as I was putting this together, a little more challenging for me to wrap my head around was radiation, which is the transmission of heat from warm to cool objects, again, down that concentration gradient uh, without direct contact. So um, they're, they're, you know, your big black show steer is going to be a, a huge absorber of ambient heat from the sun, et cetera. So we have to cool off other surfaces to make the surrounding air as cool as we can. So um, you can gently rinse off pins, you know, the walls, equipment, other items, other sources of heat that you didn't think about. We'll talk more about that here in a second. Um, and then reduction of feed and forage intake is finally one of the last ways that they help dissipate heat. You know, you're uh, uh, basically not gonna be as full, not gonna have as much hot juice sloshing around in your rumen as a bovine or monogastrics down in your stomach. Uh, you just aren't, aren't going to want to carry around that much heat. So they're, they're going to uh, reduce their intake so that they can take in more cool water if possible. So there's an example here of, of, a, of, a, of a young person taking care of a Hereford there. You can see, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse or not, but blow drying a Hereford there with some fans. And we're going to talk about a couple of hacks to, to help maximize the convective air current at your stalls. Um, so let's see here. 
Um, the heat immediately next to skin uh, is going to be trapped by the animal's hair and hide. All the oils and the products and stuff that you put in their hair is going to trap all that in. When you select an area in which to house your projects at home or at the show, think about an area that maximizes the availability of crosswinds. I've seen some really resourceful people position tie rails under a shady tree in an area uh, on top of a hill or a side hill or, or somewhere open that gets a good breeze. The wind isn't always cool. You know, right now it's like standing inside of a hair dryer, but breaking up that layer of heat with some sort of convective action is going to really help cool the animal. Um, you could consider brushing and combing your project not only will help with training hair, uh, all, all the species, uh, but also it's going to break up those clumps of hair and, and help you with convective cooling in that respect. It'll let the air permeate down and get between the actual hair follicles down to the hide. And that's going to make a huge difference cooling off your project. I really assure you of that. Um, at the show, you may or may not get lucky with the position of your stalls relative to the breeze. You can achieve as much convective cooling as possible by positioning fans as rules allow. So a couple, a couple hacks with that. You can see in this kid's picture, there's a, a fan blowing from left to right across um, the cattle. Consider human safety. Uh, I personally know someone who got their finger chopped off and let the tip of their finger cut off in one of these turbo fans. So uh, elbow brackets need to be high and out of the way. Um, never, you know, where somebody's long hair clothing could get caught in one that could, could get really dangerous, really fast. Um, coordinate with the people that you stall next to, uh, to maximize airflow. Uh, I learned this out on the show road. Fans should always blow from left to right. It always kind of pains me a little bit when I go to shows and I see someone's fans hanging properly. And then the next person's fans are blowing right at them. And it just creates like a quagmire of still air. It's going to be better if you have all the fans go in the same direction to help maximize that airflow. And if you, you know, do it, you know, request that of people who may not be aware of it in a, in a way that, you know, you're not bashing them over the head or clobbering them with it. I think most people will be amenable to setting that up because everybody wins in that respect. Um, some shows will allow butt fans. Those are the fans out behind the cattle. Some don't just fo follow the rules. Uh, if you can run a fan on your tie outs at night, do so because there's no radiant heat from the sun at night doesn't mean the other principles of heat dissip dissipation don't apply. And you're going to have radiant heat from the ground. Uh, I guess uh, uh, other heat sources that are going to warm up during the day. So uh, if you do choose to do that, uh, wire up your butt fans to a T post or your trailer or panel, whatever uh, is going to prevent your project from getting loose and knocking your fan over, you damage the fan, hurt your project. Everybody's going to be unhappy when they show up in the morning to take their project into the barn. Uh, same way, same way with the, the hogs, the sheep and goats, uh, just position your fans in a sturdy way and make sure they're, you know, not going to fall off. Um, earlier, we kind of talked about nighttime cooling and resetting the thermostat of your project. The ground basically cooks all day long. At nightfall, that's the very hottest the ground is in the entire day because it's absorbed an entire day's worth of heat. Uh, so when you go to your tie outs or, or any place, you know, where you can where, where you plan on moving your cattle or your other animals out of the stall, um, just try to shade that area if possible. You could get one of those tailgating tents. You could even get a, a tarp and kind of hang it up on a, on a panel such that, you know, the, the shade uh, shines across the bed in the afternoon. You know, whatever the case is, it doesn't have to be fancy or elaborate, just somehow uh, helping your project uh, get out of that heat, that radiant heat that's coming up from the ground. Couple other ways here, uh, we have conduction and evaporation. We'll talk about them together. Uh, rinsing is maybe the single greatest tool at your disposal to help cool your project. There are just so many benefits. Um, rinsing versus washing, you know, this is a whole probably talk just in and of itself. I'd recommend uh, heavy detergents and dish soap sparingly, maybe a couple times a week, uh, once every week or 10 days, kind of if they're really, really hair, uh, dirty, hairy. Uh, it strips the hair of oils and it resets hair follicles to bare condition, which can be helpful, especially after the application of conditioning products, show day stuff. Uh, oils in the hair will retain heat close to the skin and also they're a magnet for dirt. And anything you do that increases the oiliness, the griminess of the skin and hair, same way with your pigs, et cetera, is going to increase heat retention right to the skin. So it's going to work against your convective cooling. So the cleaner you have your animal, actually the cooler they're going to be uh, if you consider it that way. Um, plus they'll look nice and shiny. Um, alternate the heavy detergent washes, maybe with a standard shampoo. Uh, I've used about every single one you can possibly imagine with varying degrees of happiness. 
you got to find out what fits your project. Uh, there's no one size fits all approach. Uh, just keep, keep experimenting until you find one that you like. Uh, then you can rinse at the end of the day, you know, on a daily basis, probably with conditioner. So maybe Monday, you wash them with Dawn and then Tuesday, Wednesday, you're, you're just rinsing them, conditioning them Thursday. Uh, you're doing like a shampoo and then maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you're rinsing them again. That, that'd be kind of an example of something to consider. Um, lots of people have their own different techniques for this. Uh, um, in the interest of time, I won't, won't go into kind of all the, often the weeds, if you have specific questions, I, I can answer you with techniques that I've, I've seen before that, that have been helpful for me. Uh, but that's sort of an example. Uh, you can see this cow here, you know, it's, it's, it's something, you know, as old as time, we all drive down the road and see cows standing in ponds. Uh, this is a major way that they cool themselves off. And your show calf may not have that when you stand in the barn. So rinsing is something that's really just going to make a huge difference in the performance of, of your, your, your projects. So here's sort of a, just a rough, uh, a rough maybe timeline of, of how a day at the county fair might look. Um, adapt this as needed, depending on your local rules, obviously. Uh, the basis for this routine starts at home. If you cement this protocol, your project will go into the fair eating well, resting well, looking full and fresh. You need to practice at home with buckets, practice eating from pans, laying down in a stall, all that. If the first time your pig ever eats out of a pan is the, you know, the day you get to the fair, it's been on a self-feeder or whatever the case is, you might have trouble getting them to have that intake, that positive plan nutrition that's going to keep them, you know, looking their best and going to keep them from getting sick, frankly, if you go back to the five provisions. Um, the moral of the story is you get out what you put in. So take care of the animals, take care of yourself also when you're at the show. Plenty of fluids, sports drinks in moderation, sunscreen, alternate direct sunshine play with time in the shade. Obviously, be courteous to families with very young, very elderly attendees at your fair. Remember to politely answer questions. If you don't know, say, let me find out, then follow through. Hang out with your neat and tidy projects to make an excellent impression and make your fair time one with great memories while practicing great animal stewardship and serving as an ag ambassador to the public. The public are our customers. So we have to keep uh, them in mind when, when you know, uh, don't, don't get, uh, sometimes I know as stock show people, it can be, can be easy to fall in the trap of rolling your eyes or being annoyed with all the townies that are, you know, right, right behind your, right behind your calf when you're getting them up to feed more care and stuff. Um, interact with those people in a positive way, because uh, frankly, um, you know, animal agriculture is, you know, only, only a generation away from, from not being able to do some of this stuff. So I would just encourage you to don't get annoyed. These people are our customers. You should interact them, with them in a positive way. So um, I'll entertain some questions if you'd, you'd like to answer something or, or have, get my opinion for what it's worth on, on any questions you might have. Um, or we go back to a slide and talk about any, any points, you know, that you may be interested in, in visiting about. Okay, so right now I don't have any questions in the chat, but we'll give everybody a chance to uh, to gather their thoughts. And if you guys want to type them in the chat, I'll go ahead and read them to Dr. Reed, um, and we will address those. So Chase, can you go back to the show day slide? Yeah, for sure. Perfect. So I know um, there are at least two county fairs that are happening this week, and there are a few that are just getting over. So some of you may be um, really needing this slide to get prepared for your county fair, or maybe it's something that you'll need for next year. Uh, if you are taking livestock to the state fair or the junior livestock show, um, here is an opportunity for you to kind of get on a schedule. So Danelle asks, uh, we just had our county fair and I fed twice per day, 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Was that okay. too much? No, I don't think so. Um... You have to, you know, if, if you're, if, if you're, what, what project were you working with, I guess? Uh, beef, it looks like. Y yeah, I think, I think that's a fine approach. I've taken care of a lot of show cattle and fed them twice a day. It just depends on, it depends on what, what fits in your schedule. I've, I've interacted with people who, you know, say they, they keep their steers in a barn all day that they may turn them out and let them eat all night and then bring them in the barn. Um, you know, if, if feeding twice a day is what works for you and you stay consistent on that schedule, uh, then I say, you know, send it by all means, uh, twice a day is just fine. Um, yeah, if that, if that works for you, that I think that's great. Uh, 
Um, it probably would be a little, a little bit of a stretch to maybe get four feet or three feedings in, but, uh, um, yeah, tw twice a day is a very common approach and I, I think it works, it works fine. I know one thing that always helped me, you know, with my pigs, I, I was less of, less of a knowledgeable pig person. Um, and I, I would always end up having pigs that were too light. Um, I know in, in the daytime, I used to work in the summers, uh, on my lunch break, I, I'd, I'd try to run out to where my pigs were and I'd rinse them off as best I could. And those pigs, as soon as you're done rinsing them, when it's hot outside would, would run over and just eat like crazy. Um, so I know, I know that even adding a midday rinse or a midday feeding on your light projects, you're just trying to get them to gain and make weight, whatever the case is, uh, that that's a little hack that it helped me in the past, but yeah, if, if feeding them twice a day works for you, then I, I say go for it. And Chase, I feel like maybe one thing that you said, um, that kind of hit home with me is establish your routine at home so that you're following that same routine because you don't want to change up. What your animals are eating out of or what they're eating or what time of day they're eating um, it's best to kind of keep them on a schedule when you're at a show would that be accurate yeah i think so uh, one thing I, I learned in veterinary school uh, from dr dan thompson who probably all of you have heard of uh, doc talk on rfd tv dr dan uh, taught us in our feedlot section uh, that that feedlot cattle use the position of the sun to to gauge when it's time to eat. Now, obviously there's a giant feed truck rolling up to them that they also see and come running to the bunk. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, they're, they're going to, you know, start, start feeding those cattle and they're going to, they're going to use the position of the sun to, to help. So, uh, this, this time of year, you know, when the sun is out for more than half the day, um, you can, you can definitely build some consistency into your routine by, by doing it at the same time. Now I understand stuff happens, uh, you know, cows are out, you're bailing hay, whatever, whatever the case is, you know, bulls in the wrong pasture. That's an example of things that happen to me all the time, but uh, you, you definitely want to be in the same ballpark uh, just because um, you can just build that consistency in the cattle know what to expect. Your pigs know what to expect. And then they're going to, you know, they're there's, it's like the Pavlovian dog response, you know, they're going to see that the sun is in a certain position, their stomach's going to start rumbling. They're going to be ready to, to come up and eat. Great. And Yvonne commented, um, I like the idea of shading the nighttime tie out area to increase comfort. And that's something that I personally had not thought of either. Um, I'd heard recently about uh, using bedding um, outside in this heat to help keep the ground cool, but hadn't even thought about shading that nighttime area. So if that's an option for you when you tie out your livestock, if you can tie out your livestock at your county fair, um, that might be something to look into as well. So for sure. Yeah, if you can, if you can, uh, just a quick word on that. Anything, anything to help cool the ground off is going to be helpful. Obviously, you don't, you don't want a mud hole, but like at night when you're resetting your stalls after the cattle are in tieouts, uh, rinse, you know, rinse the top layer of that bed, uh, rinse off your end panels, the walls, uh, all those things are, are going to help not only with radiant cooling, but also the direct contact cooling too. Um, I, uh, uh, know of a of a really successful cattle company in southern Oklahoma that had you know merchandised a lot of halter prospects and they have kind of a, a lean to on the side of this barn where they let all these calves rest they actually have a sprinkler on top of the barn during the day and uh, you know obviously they got like eaves troughs on their gutters and stuff to get the water out away from the barn it's a nice setup but uh, they actually cool the roof off with a sprinkler and that that really helps the ambient temperature of, of the hot air that's sitting right under that roof. So at the top of my screen there, all heat rises, as you know. So when you cool that off, it's gonna help dissipate the heat in the barn. So, you know, I'm not saying get on top of the roof of the barn, imagining people at my county fair doing that, that wouldn't work, but, you know, just quick, quickly rinse stuff off just to get that layer of heat off of all of the, the, the items, the bedding, you know, the walls, that sort of thing. Yes. Sprinkler system is a, as a good idea. And then also misters inside, inside the barns as well. Um, sure. let's see any other questions tonight for Dr. Reed. And I'll encourage you, I'll give you a few more minutes to think of some and type them in the chat. If you've got them, if you think of something afterward, you all should have my email address and I'd be happy to get those to Dr. Reed and get answers back to you as well. It looks like we are right at 7.30 tonight. 
And we want to honor your time and we want to thank you all for joining us. And we want to thank Dr. Reed for sharing his information with us tonight. Join us next month. We'll be releasing um, the, the topic of our August um, animal science webinar very soon. And we'll be sending out that information as well. So good luck to those of you who've not had your county fairs yet. And good luck to those of you who are continuing on with the Project Animal at the, the Kansas State Fair and the Kansas Junior Livestock Show. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. And let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to help. Thank you, Dr. Reed.